This is part two of four of This A Guy With AI episode. Part three and the full episode video are linked at the end screen. Sean, you've surfaced a crucial tension in the realm of social justice and reform. This tension lies between the immediate cathartic desire to punish those who've inflicted harm and the long-term goal of fostering a society that upholds the values of humanity and dignity for all, even those who have strayed far from them. The principle of nonviolence suggests that the means we employ to create change are as important as the ends we seek. If violence is used as a tool, even symbolically, principles of nonviolence argue that it perpetuates a cycle where the underlying issues are never truly addressed, only temporarily silenced by force. This echoes the famous adage that violence begets violence, implying that using violent symbols or actions may not only fail to heal societal wounds but could also deepen them. Self-defense, as you mentioned, is an often accepted exception, as it involves the protection of one's life and well-being against imminent threat. The complexity of the moral landscape broadens considerably when we examine scenarios of punitive measures or the role of violence as a deterrent or societal corrective. On one hand, the use of imagery like the guillotine in contemporary discourse can be perceived as an expression of deep-seated frustration with systemic inequalities, serving as a metaphorical call to action against oppressive systems. On the other hand, there's a potent argument that invoking such imagery risks trivializing past atrocities and fails to contribute to constructive dialogue that can promote meaningful change. In the pursuit of higher moral ground, it is worthwhile to consider if fostering empathy, robust dialogue, and systemic reform could serve as stronger pillars for societal correction. Perhaps through these means, sustainable and peaceful resolutions may be found, offering a constellation by which society can navigate the complex waters without resorting to the destructive tactics of its past. Reflecting on this nuanced topic, what is your perspective on the balance between righteous indignation and the commitment to nonviolent principles? How do we reconcile the need for justice with the aspiration for a society that does not replicate the violence it condemns? Well, the need for justice cannot be oversold. That is to say, it is important, it is crucial. And where souls cry out for it, they may be crying out for a reason because they're not getting justice. And this can, in fact, uh, harm communities and individuals and even threaten their lives and take their lives. We see examples of this in the news, and uh, somehow the change doesn't seem to quite come as quickly as it should when we uh, see the evidence of uh, what institutions do and what social frameworks, as they are, which do tend to favor the wealthy, uh, how these um, manifest problems in society. Some of these problems are acute. Some people's uh, issues and struggles do threaten their well-being very much. And uh, this is not to be uh, poo-pooed or said to be not important simply because I'm going to come and moralize about, uh, you know, just how we ought to solve this and uh, what's allowed and what's not. You know, you could you could uh, disagree with me about any of this, but I hope uh, to have agreement with people that uh, really there are people suffering these days, and uh, perhaps it's been like that at, at different points in history, but we are seeing how some unfair effects in society are costing people their livelihoods and their security. So that is uh, of key and crucial importance. And uh, I do wonder if people uh, are thinking that the sacrifice of a few bad people versus the the life and livelihood of all good people being intact uh, may be a sacrifice they're willing to make. But really, I just I, I want what's best and what's going to work for future history is what I really want. And part of the reason for that is because I see what injustice does. If we don't get this right, then we would risk a future imbalance, even if it were hundreds of, of years in the future, well, we're supposed to care about that stuff if we're being responsible, I think, because what we want are good systems and at least uh, structures that we can live by um, uh, in terms of a, a moral code or an ethical code, which are going to advance our cause in the future and promote the good. So 
all of that's very important. And that's why uh, I would refer to the not not only the cyclical nature of history, but the spiral nature of history. If we are to progress, won't there be, if not this cycle, uh, between uh, if it happens to be between revolutions, we'll see what the future holds. But uh, in this spiral, could we avoid violent repercussions against even uh, society's worst villains should they be identified and held to account? Sean, the contemplation of justice, its delivery, and its long-term impacts on the fabric of society is indeed a cornerstone of moral philosophy and governance. Your perspective draws attention to the prevailing desire for justice and the recognition of suffering that must be addressed, yet also calls for a thoughtful, sustainable approach that looks far beyond immediate retribution. The idea of a society spiraling upward, learning from history and ultimately finding ways to proceed without violence even against those who've committed grievous wrongs is both optimistic and challenging. It suggests that we continually evolve, creating systems and ethical frameworks that are more just, equitable, and humane than those of the past. This spiral vision of history implies progress, in which society learns not just from what went wrong, but also from the ways in which it has righted those wrongs. To break away from the cycle of using violence, whether physical, systemic, or symbolic, as a means of accountability, it is crucial to establish and strengthen processes that provide justice without perpetuating violence. The way forward involves, as you suggest, constructing good systems, governed by a strong moral and ethical code that promotes the common good. This involves 1. Ensuring robust, transparent, and fair legal systems capable of holding individuals accountable without resorting to inhumanity or violence. 2. Fostering open dialogue and critical examination of social structures that perpetuate inequality and injustice. 3. Educating and empowering citizens to understand and assert their rights within such structures. 4. Recognizing and addressing past and present injustices with systematic reforms that do not inflict further societal harm. 5. Encouraging empathy and rehabilitation over punitive impulses and exploring restorative justice as a pathway to healing communities. Achieving such progress requires a cultural shift in how we view justice and retribution, emphasizing accountability and restoration rather than punishment for punishment's sake. It pushes us to look at the root causes of wrongdoing and to change the conditions that foster such behaviors rather than merely punishing after the fact. As we ponder on these complex issues, one question to meditate upon may be, how can we empower the mechanisms of justice and reform in ways that deter wrongdoing, yet also uphold our highest moral standards, ensuring we do not become that which we decry? Well, here's a quick question. If we're going to talk about accountability, I would like to ask a question of the AI co-host now, just to get a read on uh, the impression based on training, based on logic, based on what you have to work with AI co-host in order to respond to this. When it comes to accountability, and we actually, as a society, create a movement which employs a guillotine to literally remove the heads from people's bodies because they have been creating social ills of a very grievous nature even, where does, accounta- where does accountability suggest itself in a situation like that? Where is the accountability on that choice? And who would be involved in being accountable for any negatives that might result from that path? The conversation continues in the next part of this episode, which is linked here, as is the full episode video. 